Hey, welcome, David here. Been preparing the stream for quite a while. Topic offhand, you want to do, get back into uh, topical streams about uh, stuff close to my heart and uh, you know stuff that I'm researching, stuff that's important uh, you know to society and to my livelihood, to what I do. You know, at the end of the day, David is mostly a scientist, obviously. Religion is very important to me. Judaism is very important to, to me. I have different ideas on immigration and multiculturalism. Uh, but end of the day, Duvid is a scientist. That's what I do for a living. I'm here in Detroit. That's what I'm most active in. That's what I spend a bulk of my time professionally doing. And so let me just uh, enter a screen share. I have a lot of information on this. I've been preparing it. Um, you know, people are interested and want to talk about this, or you know, pure, I want to talk purely about uh, this uh, issue of driverless cars. And if anyone uh, you know, wants to come on that uh, actually knows something about this, that might be possible. Otherwise, I'm just gonna monologue. It might be as much as three hours. So let's just get started. Um, you know, people see on Facebook. Uh, I've been going to events like this for a long time. Um, you know, we're in Detroit. We're a technology hub, home of the car. Here, let me drop this in uh, the chat. And uh, here's an auto conference, the technology advancements. This one's in uh, November. You see uh, your breakout sessions from all types of people, from the head of industry talking about the future of driverless cars and uh, University of Michigan. You know, obviously, where I'm an alumni from, I'm probably not going to go to this. They, they they usually charge large sums of money for these, so yeah, I usually only go to the free ones. And it's the nature of uh, you know people are just intellectually curious about uh, this versus people who are in the field and you're trying to make money off of. It. And obviously, we're going to talk about the economics and the expense of this. So uh, you know, let me just show a few of these things. Here's a testing facility in uh, Michigan for driverless cars. I'm going to be talking purely about autonomous and driverless vehicles today and uh, what they are, the history of them, the future of them, where they're going, technology. And uh, I have a lot of PowerPoints, presentations, papers, uh, reading material. After that's done, the video, you know, people who are watching live and want to comment on the issue, that's fine. If uh, people actually know something about this, I consider bringing them on to talk about it. Um, but uh, this might be more useful to watch in replay. I'll add in the description uh, the timestamps like I usually do, and I'm just dropping these links in. So here's this uh, facility in uh, Metro Detroit. See, like it's a huge facility for autonomous testing where they have a, you know, specifically designed uh, in ways to test the new vehicles. You see some aerial pictures. It's a 2.5 mile loop unidirectional, not two-way traffic, just one, featuring uh, two and three lanes. Speeds go between 50 and 65 miles an hour. It's got the you know, bypass tunnel, um, different things. This will run the old Ford uh, bombing factory. I actually might be touring there. Part of the reason I'm doing this is I think I'm going to be touring there this uh, Friday. So uh, let's... Uh, Okay, so let, let me just clear off my desktop, putting some of these. So here is a RAND report. People know the RAND Corporation, one of the biggest companies in America, research uh, studies. So this is a guide to policy reports for uh, influence the government for the policy needed for the future of uh, driverless autonomous vehicles. And you see that autonomous vehicles relies on many, many different technologies converging together. And you know, pe people are more interested in the topic. I encourage you to read through all 200 pages. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in, Nazbol. Yeah, so I, I have a lot of good visuals. So let me just you know get my voice and talking a second so I could get, get into this. And hopefully, you're you know you're going to learn a lot and it's going to be useful to everyone watching. So uh, you know, here you got you know, just a history. What are autonomous vehicles? Uh, what decisions to policymakers? You have the social cost, the different economic uh, effect on safety and crashes, um, mobility for those unable to drive, uh, you know, relations to traffic, energy, emissions, alternative fuels, uh, you know, the current state of laws across the U.S., history, 
and I have slides that are, you know, I'm not going to be reading from this in just to give more reading material. This is a whole 700 page book. You know, this could be a whole college textbook on uh, autonomous vehicles if someone was interested in, you know, the technical, legal, and social aspects. This uh, might be from Germany. Um, finger open. I, I didn't even read through this. I, like I flipped through one article, uh, but just to see the you know potential of issues. You know, part one: man and machines, automated driving, its social, historical, and cultural context, uh, ethics, uh, interaction between humans and autonomous agents, you know, communications and communication problems, the political, legal, social, sustainability, and you know tons of articles. So people are more. Uh, you know, academically attuned. Here's a whole 700 page textbook. If you took like a graduate course on the topic in engineering, uh, you know, that would be okay. Yeah, didn't even let me share that link. I'm sorry. Okay, so here, let me show this article now. So let me get more to the bulk of the issue. We'll, we'll jump right in. I just wanted to, you know, some of the stuff I read, some of the stuff that might be more interesting on the issue to uh, people who want to delve into it more in depth. OK, so that, that may have been an illegal copy. I apologize if that, that was uh, um, you know, the textbook or whatever that I found online. OK, so here is a, a quick overview of the history of uh, driverless cars. You're saying that's not unique. You know, 1925, you got Francis Houdini demonstrates a radio controlled car. Uh, maybe as a kid, you noticed, uh, you know, we had uh, radio controlled cars and airplanes and, uh, you know, that's not a new technology and, uh, you know, saying that there's a long history of it. I'm going to have some PowerPoints too, but just want to say, uh, you know, John McCarthy, 1969, had a robo chauffeur, one of the founders of artificial intelligence. This article, I think, even has videos of it. Uh, capable of navigating a public road via television camera inputs that uses the same visual input available to a human driver. So these, although you may have had people in a control box controlling them, um, to the driver itself, they were autonomous. Then you had no hands across America in the 1990s, Carnegie Mellon, uh, neural networks, the, you know, the concept we'll see later in the PowerPoints where the intellectual scientific background from the 90, uh, 80s into the early 2000s Till 2002, DARPA announces its grand challenge. It creates a 142-mile course through the Mojave Desert and a team, you know, million-dollar cash prize to whoever could develop a car. And uh, 2004, when it came, none of the 15 competitors were able to do it. A uh, one car makes eight miles and burns, doesn't make it through. So you see in the state in 2004, driverless cars weren't there. Although the later research car companies then Google comes out 2009 Google has reasonable looks like there might be such a thing as autonomous vehicles and we're going to look in what what it takes to make an autonomous vehicle uh, you know viable that uh, and uh, you know then Uber 2013 you have uh, companies General Motors Ford Mercedes BMW, Basically, everyone, all the major car companies start working on uh, autonomous vehicles, and they say that by 2020, it's going to be ready. And we're going to look at uh, exactly what autonomous means in the level to having a car that drives by itself to the pre precursor steps. Um, you know, there's been testing on it. Obviously, now we do have autonomous vehicles. There are cars on the road that could be fully piloted by the computer. And uh, Tesla had a you know, fatal accident in the news, the Audi A8 is the first level three production. We're going to get into what these level productions are, and that's going to be very important for the phasing in of technology and the level. Um, so NVIDIA makes a chip, the Xavier, that will incorporate artificial intelligence capabilities, machine learning into autonomous vehicles. And uh, you know, so a little history. So let's look at Tesla right now. So what, what's currently available on the market? So Tesla, I'm going to show some PowerPoints. I just want to get a little re reading material and clear up my desk space. I'm going to jump right in. So Tesla has your, um, your long range. You're talking about 75750 for the, is this the Tesla 
I don't even know what model this is. I'm not a huge expert in the models, but this is currently what's on the market right now. So you could get autopilot and full self-driving capability supposedly coming soon. So autopilot enables your car to steer, accelerate, and brake automatically for other vehicles and pedestrians within its lane. That is currently on the market when you buy a $75,000 Tesla for free $3,000 more. You could have autopilot enabled. And for another $5,000, um, full self-driving cap uh, capability, automatic driving from highway on-ramp to off-ramp, including interchanges and overtaking slower cars, auto park and summon. Your parked car will come and find you anywhere in a parking lot. So that, from what I understand, that is currently available. If anyone has enough money, you could currently purchase a Tesla that has autopilot. We'll look at the state regulations and where you could actually do this. A autopilot that will self-drive on the highway. You tell the car what exit you're getting on, which one you're getting off, and uh, the car will drive on autopilot. And uh, you know these uh, features. This is currently available on the market. Okay, so let's jump right into some PowerPoints. Um, there's a lot of concepts here that are going to be important, and uh, the, a lot of this is going to be repetitive. I have a lot of material, a lot of visuals, and it was hard. You know, like. I take I took these from other professors online who had these, so uh, um, you know the information is going to be repetitive and uh, you know my time constraints. Uh, this is the best I'm going to be able to do, but hope this is useful to people watching. If it's not useful to you, at least it's useful to me and my own you know study for myself, my own knowledge, and you know kind of to let other people know what I'm thinking about, what areas interest me, or even professionally, uh, you know, it's like a resume for myself and. Uh, professionally what I'm doing here in Detroit, and I do plan on streaming. So, I mean, this is from a university professor, professor of engineering at University of Michigan. It's back to 2015, talking like, you know, some people are saying it's a far way off, and other people are saying it's really soon, you know, like Google and Tesla and Ford, who are saying like, yeah, any day you're going to see driverless cars on the road. And you have other people like, you know, Warren Buffett and General Motors and different companies saying it's a far way off. Um, you know, what's the difference? You had your know, old mechanical drive, combustion engines, oil-based, mechanical and hydraulic, standalone, personally owned, human-operated, general purpose. The new car is electrical drive, electric motors, diverse energy sources, electronic and digital, connected and coordinated, shared, driverless, tailored. And uh, hopefully we're going to discuss all of these things when we look at uh, the benefits to the consumer and the benefit to the user, you can see actually insurance would go down most crashes in vehicles. We're going to see it show statistics are caused by driver error. Hands-free, time availability, um, stolen car recovery, uh, a lot of benefits, benefits to users, usage-based insurance, uh, driver scores, warranty reduction, vehicle development, and hopefully we're going to get into all these. You know, so this was one of the first Google self-driving cars. Strategic partnerships, uh, different uh, truck autom automation projects that uh, possibly you might like Tesla. You might see private wealthy people that will buy autonomous vehicles as they come out over the next few years. They will probably be you know close to a hundred thousand, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and we're going to look at some of the cost and you know how long it's going to take the cost to come down. However, truck autom automation, bus automation might come much quicker where the companies who are doing shipping and have huge uh, fleets that could consider uh, um, uplating like the Army, you know, the University of Michigan, I have on my Facebook uh, pictures, the Trans uh, Mobility Transformation Center, they are partners with basically every major company. And you see that there's a lot of uh, convergent technologies that are required in order to make autonomous vehicles. It's not just about the car, it's about a whole series of, you know, computers, artificial intelligence, uh, communications, uh, cybersecurity, and hopefully we cover all of that. So you know, the business model of autonomous vehicles might change, you know, where you used to buy a car and gasoline and insurance. Now you might uh, not actually own the car if it's autonomous. The autonomous car doesn't necessarily have to sit in your driveway. It can just come and pick you up and we'll look at some of the new models that uh, might come in. So you know, they're safer, more convenient, more productive, more personalized, and uh, eventually more affordable. And one of the concepts here is the time cost of money. And uh, we're going to see some more detailed uh, studies on 
uh, the economics of uh, driverless cars. But here's just an estimate looking at the cost of the vehicle. Um, there'll be reasons we'll understand why driverless cars will actually be cheaper, uh, but the main benefit will be the time that the driver could be doing doing something else. Yeah, so you got fewer fatalities, injuries, lower health costs, lower energy use, lower CO2 emissions, lower congestion, better land use, more equitable access. So this was 2015, said so possibly by 2018. We'll look what's currently available on the open market like we saw with Tesla versus what the technology supports. And for the production line, like here in Detroit, you have, uh, you know, like, hopefully I'm going to be live streaming more of these conferences, technology conferences I go to. Um, but you have the tier system, you know, like tier one, two, three suppliers. And you're looking at who is going to be involved in the business of uh, applying these, the actual car when you buy a uh, full automated, automatic car versus the suppliers that are making different access for the car and how they're going to play in. And, you know, a lot of these different uh, technologies are going to emerge simultaneously. And we're going to look at this tiered system that uh, is become standardized for understanding. And, you know, things like Internet of uh, Things, integrated intermodal systems, that other technologies re re related to computer technology, mobility, communication, will coincide with uh, the development of uh, the technology of the cars and this stuff is pretty complicated and, and you know that's why it's going to be a long stream hopefully my voice will stay strong god willing and uh you know advice to policy you know we're going to talk about how the government should go about this so let me let me do these powerpoints and uh no i mean high testosterone i showed you that uh powerpoints are currently available on the market and uh you know, let's look at automation. This one's like airport automation where you have a little bit of a history lesson. And then I'm going to have some detailed studies about uh, you know, the, the top scientist and the reports of what's available and what's coming. So this is you know, already back 2013, but we're looking about automation in general. And uh, you know, 1971, Tampa Airport has an automated people mover. In 1974, uh, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, as their rapid transit system, which is an automated uh, monorail system that doesn't have a driver. And uh, you know now, basically, all world-class airports, major airports have these driverless monorails. Um, you know, so the difference between these is that those were bounded systems. Those were you know tracks and rails, and you could have them scheduled and a computer run, and maybe just one or a few people monitoring the office. But they had tracks and rails. They, you know, dedicate, dedicated cartway as opposed to driverless uh, vehicles will not be operating on a track. They're going to be in uh, non-exclusive environments and uh, operating under unknown conditions, which, uh, you know, that's why. So you had these driverless vehicles going back uh, to the 70s in the sense of, uh, you know, the dedicated pathways that existed. So you have, uh, you know, Milan already has a driverless metro. If you're like in the New York subway, you know, or the subways mostly in America, there is a driver conductor on it. But uh, you know, Milan in Spain, Heathrow, um, different places, Australia and Chile, in terms of you know, mines and uh, construction and uh, industrial work, there these things are already in operation. So there's going to be converging. I'm going to be talking mostly about on-road automobiles, but the technology is used for a lot of different things. So the Google car was big in the news. They were one of the first, you know, Google obviously has huge sums of money and they were able to invest in, you know, 2070 and they've already driven over half a million miles in self-drive mode and, and uh, you know, just, uh, you, you see some of the pictures of collecting. So things that, you, I'm going to show you these level things where, where there's levels of automation that are already in current cars that you could see that cars are semi already automated uh, to the point where you don't even have to drive, where, where automation is partially taking over to eventually there'll be full 
drivers. So things like automatic parking have existed. Maybe some people, uh, I had a car that had driver assist parking, you know, BMW already 10 years ago that had uh, assisted parking and now automated parking. Uh, I've seen people have cars. Um, we're going to look more into the sensors and the radar, the type thing like, you know, sensors going 200 meters in front and 80 meters in back and the different side vision and the different technology necessary and possibly different sensors on the road that would be feeding information that the other cars would be taught vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, communication. We'll get all this uh, terminology. So you just have a driverless car with its sensors to the environment, but that will be assisted by communication from other vehicles and communication from the infrastructure. So here was in 2013, the roadmap towards full automation. And by 2030, almost everyone's in agreement that you're going to have full automation of cars by 2030, probably earlier. You know, how that's going to factor in, we're going to look in when do all cars become autonomous, when can't you own a self-driving vehicle, uh, that might be in like 2015, we're going to look how that phase out is going to work, and uh, there'll be reasons that it will autonomous vehicles will probably phase out because most uh, driving mistakes are caused to human error, as where computers make much fewer errors than humans once the bugs could be worked out. So the business uh, economic models will push this forward. Other effects, I'm not going to be able to read through all these. There's a lot of information here. I have a lot of stuff to go through. Baggage movement, you know, th this slide is from airports, but you see that, uh, you know, certain technology isn't going to come on the road. So what you're seeing on the road uh, may be implemented in airports sooner. So let me do two more PowerPoints. This from uh, cybersecurity, another important aspect, but it had some good slides. So we're going to go into detail about these five phases from no automation to full automation. This has been accepted the standard Society of Automotive Engineers headquartered here in Detroit. I'm not officially a member. It's expensive, but I have read a lot of their material. I've been to their convention. It's here in Detroit every year. I go to their office. I'm very familiar with them. Uh, but it has been standardized by automotive engineers, this five levels of automation from no automation to full automation in the level of what the computer is going to take over at each level to the fifth level where eventually the computer will do everything. And we're going to see a lot of this. Basically, level zero, driver only, conventional vehicle, driver manages all aspects of speed and direction. Level one, assisted, driver receives support for specialized tasks like parking, already exist. Level two, partial automation, driver receives support for coping with predefined scenarios, traffic jam, warning, uh, telling people when to brake. Um, Sometimes they have like a 2.5 level three conditional automation. Driver can relinquish control to automate its system, but must be ready to take back control. Uh, that already exists. Like the Tesla automobile is currently a level three car that is on the market. Level four, significant automation. Majority of journey may be automated uh, by some driver. Intervention may be required, um, you know, to the point where still the, the Tesla car, you should be watching you could turn it over to the car, and uh, but you you shouldn't still be watching the road. Uh, you know, then we'll have level five complete automation, complete end to end journey without driver intervention. Here's a timeline. You know, level zero, level one already exists. Parking assist and uh, these different things. A lot of people, anyone's bought a new car in the last few years, very likely they have some of these features. Level two through 2020 where you're going to have assisting for your know, braking, traffic jams, uh, staying in your lane to uh, your 25, where you're going to have partial levels of letting the car take over, like the Tesla, where you could just hand it into autopilot from the time you get onto the highway till you get off. And you're looking like 2030 when you'll have completely autonomous vehicles for consumer purchase. As was the SAE, uh, protocol J3016 has been formally validated by the U.S. Department of Transport. Tesla Motors, BMW, Ford Motor, Volvo Cars have all promised to have fully autonomous cars on the road within five years. That's 2020. 
Alphabet Inc.'s Google's autonomous test vehicle will surpass 3 million test miles on public road in 2017. It's already happened. China set a goal for 10 to 20% of vehicles to be highly autonomous by 2025 and for 10% of cars to be fully self-driving in 2030. NVIDIA and Mercedes-Benz announced intention to develop a cognitive car using embedded AI technology. Cybersecurity. This is a cybersecurity company that made these supplies. Obviously, um, when computers control cars, cybersecurity will be a threat. I had an Israeli company here that demonstrated that they could uh, make a modern car break on the highway through computer hacking. Um, that obviously, that was illegal, but that was you know tested just to demonstrate that it is possible for a computer hacker to take over most current new cars. And they can't necessarily take over and automate, but they could take it over and stop your car when you're driving. You know, the new Ford 150 has millions of lines of code. Um, vehicles have electric control units that come from different vendors and different makers, like we said, with level suppliers. Um, we look at things like access to the vehicle, keyless doors, personal informations that might be on on uh, connected to your car, possibly payments and uh, you know, hijacking actually to, uh, you know, as I said, to demonstrate the hijacking of a vehicle from a computer. Ransomware, uh, you know, cyber terrorism. Uh, when the infrastructure, we're going to look at the, the automobile itself is only a part of the automation process. There's also going to be um, the infrastructure that is, needed for the autonomous vehicles to operate where there's going to be sensors and cameras and all type different things that are feeding information to the car and that it'll also be hackable so there's a lot of different solutions and i'm not going to be going too much into detail about this but uh you know, you look at that cybersecurity is a huge issue with this, and there's a lot to it. Like I was talking to you, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to person, any of those points of data pro uh, processing could potentially be hacked. So there's been certain levels that have already been implemented. A lot of people don't understand it, even to, you know the automotive engineers so there's a convergence of multiple forms of technology at the same time, and the expertise between the different fields don't necessarily match, so you're going to need different engineers from different fields. Okay, so I got one more PowerPoint, and then let me check the chat. This one's uh, also from a few years ago, but I just want the overall you know, generic base of information that we're going to go into some detailed studies that are going to give you the current outlay of what's happening, what's going to happen. So you have captive riders, just to get some uh, vocabulary here. Captive riders cannot drive, do not have access to the car. Choice riders generally have their own cars, but... Uh, so here's your levels that we talked about. Level 5 will be completely autonomous where the car drives itself. Here's your policy, kind of level 2 automation of at least two control functions designed to work in harmony, for example, like adaptive cruise control and lane centering. That's already level two. That already exists. Lane centering is a feature is a feature that you could get on a new car. Level three, vehicle controls all safety functions under certain traffic and environmental conditions where you could temporarily put your car in autopilot for certain areas. Driver expected to be available for occasional control. Level four, vehicle controls all safety functions and monitors conditions for the entire trip. Vehicle may operate well unoccupied. So that's a different uh, ranking than the SAE that I showed earlier. So what I showed here isn't uh, the generally accepted one. But just to see, it's like jam assist, active collision avoidance, where the car would sense possibly an accident and brake for you. Adaptive cruise control, where, where uh, lane centering. Automatic valet parking, so this already exists. Tesla already has cars that have automatic parking. Limited self-driving, freeways, pre-mapped or programmed routes. Good weather, be conditional. You could, you know, text while you're driving. And you are not worry about uh, doing things. I mean, you couldn't read yourself to watch the road, but there'll be quite a bit of leeway. 
to you know the full autonomous you know, vehicles where you might not even have to be in the driver's seat the car would just be driving like it was a chauffeur well, this one had some good graphics i wanted to show so i mean here we're talking like buses and and the dollar cost that is caused by human error because most accidents are caused by human error and they're not caused by something wrong happening to the car they're happened by a mistake that the driver makes And here would be an example that you know benefits. So you know, think like tailgating and the different things. Like, uh, you know, what, what would it be for buses and cars? Like, if you if the spacing between them, how much space do you need? Like, you know, like I used to teach driving years ago. You teach like don't tailgate in different things because of human error. Because you have to be ready for human error. But if there were computers and vehicle to vehicle communication, uh, tailgating might not be such a problem. Here's an example of what the benefit that uh, closer spacing could cause to uh, traffic. So these buses actually already exist. So we talked about fleet changing over to commercially available cars, to things like buses and trucks might more likely be changed over by you know, huge companies that will spend maybe even billions of dollars in uh, purchase hundreds of automated uh, vehicles for their fleet or for non-public uh, tra uh, traffic or specific areas that uh, have a switchover. Okay, so these were some PowerPoints. I mean, the, 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 just trying to do the best I could do you know, with, with uh, the limited time I have available. I did spend you know, maybe as, even as much as 10 hours trying to prepare this, but even that is... Uh, you know, hardly enough for a topic like this. So let me just check the chap. The chapel of gradual decline and disorder. I'm not sure what you're saying. High testosterone. Okay, so I'm just going to keep on going. If anyone in the chat has uh, relevant information, go ahead. Let's look at uh, some more detailed presentations. Okay, so here's you know business insights. Self-driving road vehicles present a disruption that is unprecedented in both magnitude and scope. At the same time, the extent and timing of self-driving vehicles commercialization depends on the outcome of many uncertain forces that will play out in ways that no one can accurately predict. You know, hence this is a business advertising firm that made these uh, streams. You know, the SAE levels of automation, the ones that in the other chart that may have been from Europe or pre this standards are basically given and we see um, you know a lot of these do exist already so we talked about adaptive cruised automated steering it already existed these are based on radar systems you know called 2d lidar uh, machine vision single stereo cameras and we're going to talk much more about this here we say level 2.5 an increasingly hands-off experience for long portions of a drive may perform some maneuvers on demand while vehicle is in motion on a highway for example tesla's implemented automated lane changes that a driver initiates via flicking the vehicle's turn signal may self-driver self-delivery on occupied vehicles to and from parking spaces autom autonomous valet mode but only on private property so that tesla has available but legally, you're not allowed to use autonomous valet mode um, yet, only on private property. Level three systems. Uh, Google has this already. It's you know not for purchase on the open market like the Tesla, but it uh, is technologically, it's there. It combines radar, camera, ultrasonic sensors with very expensive 3D LiDAR scanners. I have material in LiDAR. We'll go much more in depth on what this technology is. LiDAR scanners are used mainly for precision localization, finding the vehicle's location very precisely with reference to a pre-computed map. Secondary use of LiDAR scanners is obstacle detection. Human factors. Real-world testing has found that it's difficult for humans to take over control from the automated system when requested. Drivers may take 60 seconds or more to regain the situational awareness needed to drive safely. 
course, fully automated vehicles won't have this problem, and level four vehicles have means to mitigate it. Mapping and sensing lighters are expensive and limited, but many companies are working on better and cheaper lidar. So there's a lot to this, you know, time limiting. This is a uh... so. Um, driverless cars is actually going to be more economical. It will save money, but requires advanced technology and a phase-out. Um, you're saving money from injuries and fatalities. As we said, most crashes are driver-caused. Fuel cost, you know, likely driverless cars will be largely electric. Saving costs from road congestion, as a lot of congestion is caused by human error, and autonomic, aut autonomous cars will be le cause less congestion, productivity, uh, the human uh, light, the human uh, time saved. A lot of industries are going to be connected to this. You know, saying it's not just going to be. You'll see it. The vehicles on the road, like people probably see Teslas all over the place already, um, but uh, is will have an effect on basically the whole, um, all aspects of society. You know, just say the convergence of so many different factors and technology that are going to go together to make this uh, work. And you know, so obviously, if you're from a business perspective, you have to know that the scenarios are going to shift. You can't exactly plan for how this is going to phase out because there's so many different factors and technologies going together that uh, you have to plan for many different contingencies. So here's a more detailed map out of uh, the likelihood of when these things are going to phase out. Um, you know, this includes key aspects of the scenarios, including business conditions, product, service, and technologies. So you have the automation systems, applications, and the vehicle applications. Driver assistance till 2025, or maybe by 2025, we'll get up to that level four compliance features and yeah, you know, I encourage people to you could pause this and look through or replay this because it's really an in-depth topic. This is a you know cutting line top of technology field, one of the most important issues in the world of technology today. You know, here's more different scenarios of uh, possibly phasing in. So you know saying how are these things going to phase in? What's going to come first? And scheduling is actually of my field more for construction, but to schedule these things is basically impossible. So you have to just look at the different scenarios and push forward in your different areas. And we could see, you know, different things that could change how these things are going to get phased out or what's going to come newer or later. And I have more stuff on this and uh, I'll put reading material, but just to, you know, to get some of this out there now for people watching. Okay. So here's from a forum in 2017 in Europe. Um, driving simulation and scenario factory for automated vehicle validation. Your motivations. A little history, a few things that I, I don't have time to go through all this stuff. You know, saying this is a huge topic, and I don't understand. I just have a you know one year master's degree. I'm in Detroit. I go to these conventions, but I don't I don't really understand this stuff that well. Um, so I'm doing the best of my ability to give you good information on this and uh, encourage people to look into it more. And you know, these are largely for myself, but you know, it's just an interesting history of. Uh, driverless vehicles, human errors source of 90%, some say even more of automotive crashes. Although your safer drivers are 10 times better than worse ones. So that like, uh, thank God I'm a pretty safe driver. Uh, you know, other people, you know, God forbid you know, more accidents, the little, you know, chart of uh, accidents and conventional driving preventable to automation. So the accidents that would be due to the risk of automation will be very small. 
here's looking at some of the phase in of historical and cars um you know the seat belt and uh, how long it took for these things like the automatic transmission power steering air conditioning uh the brakes radial tires electronic ignition and some of these things were phased in extremely quickly you know some things that took decades to phase in or to get to complete uh, compliance automatic transition you know, got up into well over 90 percent by the 70s and it, you know it still hasn't become 100 percent as where other things basically got to 100 percent very quickly like electronic ignition So here's more time graphs of uh, you know when we could expect these things to come, the levels of simulation, uh, you know the power of the technology, and the experts. Uh, you know these are main convention of uh, automakers over Europe. These were their projections in 2017. You know, more of this level stuff. You you know by the time you're done with this lecture, at least you know, will have these levels fully down. You know, like the level zero to level five, what it means, what we know. Um, how these phases are going to be implemented over time. So that's why into level three, our eyes on, hands off. And at some point in level, parts of level three to level four, you'll have hands off and eyes off. And, uh, you know, what, what does it take to make a driver this car? And these are the different things that are going to be put on the vehicle. And we're going to go into more detail about uh, what these different components are. There's a lot of the physics to it. Like uh, we, I might get into, depending on the time or the audience, we'll get into a little bit of like the physics and uh, you know how these things actually would operate, or you know, the computer programming aspects, the warning indicators to when the computer actually you know does something and how that works from the sensor detection to the computer processes that uh, look at that data to actually controlling the car which uh, you know does involve some parts of auto of uh, artificial intelligence I looked at these slides a few times to try to prepare to make it as good, good as presentation as possible and just to know it myself. But, you know, hopefully just if anyone's watching, it's hard to talk straight. So we could just look at these slides together and think, think. here's an example about uh, what if an animal crosses. You have a whole bunch of driverless cars and, you know, like talking with each other. And, uh, you know, so Renault, um, you know, they come here in Detroit. They've actually, you know, built like fake deers to test these type things. Okay, Melky Tzedek. Well, I'm not sure you can put people out of employment. I mean, we're looking at automation in general. Maybe if I have time or if a more more friendly audience, you know, as I mentioned, I'm constantly on the battlefield to have enough time to actually, uh, you know, do this stuff to, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to have time. But, you know, here's a conference in August coming up here. I, I, I might actually go to this. Here's um, interviews and downloadable content. There's a lot more, like, I looked at some of the stuff and thought about trying to show, but I'm not going to have enough time and my voice is already getting tired. And, you know, so I'm constantly on the battlefield to, uh, you know, actually have time to do my field of work and, you know, be the engineer that I am. I'm constantly on the battlefield. So let's look at uh, this uh, brief introduction to LIDAR the sensor that the, the technology that's going to be the key to driverless cars. An introduction to LIDAR, the key to self-driving cars from the Voyage. Your Voyage uh, is their first company from Homer, their first self-driving taxi. Homer's outfitted with a whole range of sensors to aid in understanding navigating the world, the key to which is LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging. LiDAR enables self-driving cars or, or robots 
to observe the world with a few special superpowers. So, you know, so to say they're not really superpowers for anyone who understands physics. Continuous 360 degrees of visibility. Accurate death perception, you know, up to a few centimeters. There's, you know, vehicles of the type like Uber, if you've actually seen these on the road, these type, uh, you know, boxes on top that give the 360 per, you know, uh, depth perception. How does it work? It's a uh, mathematic, it's kind of like a radar, it bounces light back and forth and measures the time. So you have, uh, you know, similar to like a car, uh, the cop speed detectors, you know, just bounces a piece of light, the light comes back and from there it can tell distances, it can see objects. By firing off millions of beams of light per second, the measurement from the LiDAR sensor enables a visualization of the world that is truly 3D. You can infer the exact measurements of any object around you up to around 60 meters, depending on the sensor. So there'd be a moving object that's constantly firing uh, millions of beams of light, and then the light's flashing back on it. And from there, you could detect objects. So the history, first you had sonar, the original de sense, uh, depth sensing robots uh, that were based on sound. Similar to, you know, possibly vision and sound that different animals use. Then you had radar, uh, like sonar is another technology made during World War II. Instead of using lighter sound waves, it utilized the radio waves to measure distance. And then LIDAR already was in the 1960s. The Apollo 15 mission on the moon, you know, like obviously the, you know, NASA in the autonomous vehicles, that's how we did our moon landings and our... Uh, the vehicles that went to the planets and the moons and, you know, so LIDAR was uh, used by NASA going back to uh, 1971. And uh, that's how we have these mappings of the surface on the moon was this technology of shooting millions of, of uh, beams of light and seeing how long it takes for them to get back. <laughs> okay, so when they had the DARPA challenge that I mentioned, in 2004, where they had test vehicles trying to go through 140 miles of the Mojave Desert. Um, that was the first time that LiDAR was utilized in cars. And, uh, you know, here you see the example on the right, the type, you know, like vision, the, the computer mind, so to say. The computer doesn't necessarily have an internal mind vision like we do. The computer is processing data. Um, but the type of uh, you know, vision that the computer could make of what's going on with uh, the LiDAR technology. Um, but that wasn't good enough, the, you know, the LiDAR technology for self-driving cars. And then 2005, they used the five SICK LiDAR sensors mounted on the roof. In addition to a military-grade GPS, gyroscopes, accelerometers, and forward-facing cameras looking out 80 meters, powered by a 1.6 gigahertz Pentium Linux PC sitting in the trunk. Fundamental challenge with SICK LiDAR is that each laser scan is essentially a cut made by a single plane, so you had to be methodical in how you pointed them. Many teams mounted them on tilting stages in order to use them to sweep a segment of space. In simple terms, SICK was a 2D LiDAR, a few beams of light in one direction, versus the modern 3D LiDARs that we know today. So Velendine, market leader in, in LiDAR, it uh, you know, was part of the audio company in 83, and David Hall, 2005, patented the 3D laser-based real-time system that's said to be the foundation for Velendine's current LiDAR products today. In the third DARPA challenge, 2007, the majority of teams used this technology as the basis for their perception system. So David Hall's invention is now in the Smithsonian as a foundational breakthrough enabling autonomous driving. And to some extent, the rest is history. There's a lot of bolts, but once this uh, 3D lighter came and with the processing, self-driving cars were almost a given. Lighter allows you to generate huge 3D maps, possibly um, with up to 500 meters ahead. 
object detection. So not only like roads, but it could detect uh, you know like deer, moving objects. You'll get for people, uh, domestic settings, different companies. You know, a lot of different companies are adding small parts to this. Here's an example of the type of computer vision that might see cars and people and objects. And add in cameras, the number of startups out there approaching the problem of self-driving cars using purely cameras with no LIDAR. Tesla, um, Elon Musk has re recently pushed the idea that if humans can perceive and navigate the world using just eyes, ears, and a brain, why can't a car? As opposed to using this LIDAR sensor to just use cameras and then the computers will detect it. So there's a lot of different companies in LiDAR, and there's a lot of different research I have on my Facebook page. Let's look at a, let's see if this video is working. Of, you know, an example of a, Okay, so there you have uh, LiDAR, one of the key technologies that make autonomous vehicles possible. So let me do this uh, 10 ways autonomous driving could redefine the automotive world. So we talked about you know, the technology, the phase, the SAEs, five different levels of automation. And now we're moving into uh, um, the technology behind it. And uh, you know, how is this going to change society, the world we know as today? So, so chat, this is from McKinsey. You know, obviously... Uh, financial company, you know, making sure they know what's going on, advising their clients. It's back in 2015, some of this is dated, but uh, you'll hear more projections. Era one, fully autonomous vehicles being developed for consumers. Uh, consumers begin to use and adopt them. And then you'll have era three, where autonomous vehicles become the primary means of transport, because you know, as of now, the technology is still being perfected. It's expensive to when consumers actually start to purchase them and use them to when uh, the regulation will likely require everyone to use this form of transport. So McKinsey, you know, leading uh, this more economic industrial fleets lead the way. Well, it's unlikely that any on-road vehicles will feature fully autonomous driver technology in the short term. AVs are already a reality in selected applications that feature controlled environments such as mining and farming. In these cases, the restricted nature of operations, private property, and the possibility to operate on private roads facilitate adoption. Some of the benefits of autonomy in these fields include labor cost savings and reduction of carbon dioxide emissions through optimal driving. Other adjacent equipment applications, uh, construction, warehouse sector, you look at Amazon's like automated warehouses, medium term through 2040, on highway trucks will likely be the first vehicles to feature the full technology on public roads. Prototypes already exist and companies are currently developing the software algorithms needed to handle complex driving situation. Long-term automated commercial fleets might include vehicles for parcel delivery as well as automated drones which multiple players are already field testing. We're going to look at these automated drones uh, that are actually currently on the market. So cars, OEMs will face the decision, operation. Automakers worldwide will likely define and communicate their strategic position on auto autom autonomous vehicles in the next two or three years. We have identified four strategic stances they can assume when introducing their autonomous vehicle offerings. Premium incumbents. Established premium players with extensive customer bases and strong technical and commercial legacies will probably take an incremental approach. This likely means that they will gradually introduce increasing levels of advanced driver assistance systems in their vehicles, attackers, new industry players developing radically new vehicle architectures such as high-tech giants, first-tier suppliers and mobility operators will focus on the accessibility mobility consumer segment to capture volumes quickly and sustain ancillary business models. Fast followers, these OEMs had significant technical and commercial legacies. They will most likely invest in AV research and then wait for the vehicle level cost of the core technologies to drop while penetration in the premium segments grow. 
late entrance non-adapters. As the name implies, these automakers will avoid entering the AV market in the short to medium term. So new mobility models will emerge while OEMs are developing autonomous vehicles. A variety of other transport mobility innovations are already hitting the road. Many of these take the form of pay-per-use models, such as car sharing, carpooling, e-hauling, e-hailing, taxi alternatives, and peer-to-peer -peer car rentals. So era two, AVs enter the early adoption phase. The car service landscape changes. The proliferation of AVs could represent an opportunity for car OEMs as of 2014. For example, roughly 80% of car service shops in Germany were independent from OEMs. Given the safety critical nature of AV technology, consumers, customers might strongly prefer strict adherence to OEM service processes and the use of original service equipment when it comes to maintaining and repairing AV systems, this could imply a disadvantageous position for the independent service providers unable to afford AV maintenance systems. Furthermore, our research shows that nearly 60% of customers would allow, would follow their smart car's recommendation for service locations beyond the benefit of a bigger after sales revenue stream. OEMs will have a strong incentive to service these vehicles since regulator, regulators could ultimately force them to take on the greatest proportion of the responsibility and risk associated with the crash caused by AV technical failures. So car insurers might shift their business models. Car insurers have always provided consumer coverage in the event of an accident caused by human error. With driverless vehicles, auto insurers might shift the core of their business model, focusing mainly on insuring car manufacturers from liabilities from technical failure of their AVs as opposed to protecting private customers from risks associated with human error and accidents. This change could transform the insurance industry from its current focus on millions of private consumers to one that involves a few OEMs and infrastructure operators similar to the insurance for cruise lines and shipping companies. Companies could reshape their supply chains. AV technologies could help to optimize the industry supply chains and logistic operations of the future. As players employ automation to increase efficiency and flexibility, AV is in combination with smart technologies could reduce labor cost well boosting equipment and faculty productivity. What's more, fully automated and lean supply chain can help reduce load sizes and stocks by leveraging smart distribution technologies in smaller AVs. So era three, AVs go mainstream. Drivers have more time for everything. Parking becomes easier. Accident rates drop. AVs accelerate robotics development for computer applications. Okay, so let's keep on going. Let me read the chat here. High testosterone, lucid. These technologies will automate uh, truck drivers and cab drivers. They're more cost efficient and safer than paying humans. Yeah, lucid. You, that's what you're saying. You have multiple scrolling out of this stuff. So, so you'll have very expensive cars on the consumer market that uh, maybe a you know few wealthy people or people who work in the field will have, and then you'll have large companies like possibly taxis or trucking companies that will be able to make a huge investment and change over their fleet so that uh, you might see trucking companies that go automated in one shot um, while at the same time you might see a handful of wealthy eccentrics that could afford these vehicles so high testosterone yeah um The amount of advancements in the AI that happened in the last 10 years was expected by virtually no one, not even with people as smart as perceptive as, as you. Yeah, so I appreciate you joining in, Lucid. So let's keep on going. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm showing you what the experts say. Uh, you know, so I'm not an expert in this. I'm, you know, this is a public study session of, uh, you know, me using the best of my ability and time available to show you what the experts are saying. So this is a global forum of, uh, Experts presentation is saying there, there's going to be 10 million autonomous vehicles on the road by 2020. Saying yes, the, the Tesla already has level three cars. The law is really only allowing up to like what they're calling level 2.5 now. It's expected by 2020. This is globally. There's going to be 10 million of them 10 years. After that, by 2030, autonomous vehicles will be the norm. There's going to, is going to be a seven trillion business expected by 2050. You here's a history 
you know, cruise control, you know, just the feature partially autonomous when we talk about the levels, like level one cruise control was already level one going back to 1948. Uh, short range communications, 1999, there was already communications uh, in cars through uh, you know, the FCC allocates a certain part of the spectrum for vehicle communication. And maybe people have like, uh, if you lose your keys or something and you, you have OnStar or something where they could remotely unlock your car or locate your car and these different things, the FCC had to dedicate part of the spectrum to that. 2007, the DARPA challenge, Google self-driving car project, 2009, um, 2012, you know, Google's advancements, 13 Mercedes comes in. Uh, I showed you the 2013, the NHTSA um initial policy that uh, later the SA changed, but that was what I was showing you in the PowerPoint earlier. Tesla, 2015, already has level two, 2.5 cars on the road. These Tesla autonomous vehicles have already been on the road for a few years. 2015, Uber hires Carnegie Mellon robotics researchers to work on autonomous vehicles, and Ford begins testing these in California, Arizona, and Michigan. Partnerships, 2016, companies start looking at it, uh, teaming up, GM, Lyft, Toyota. Um, so you know, companies are teaming up together to work on this, uh, more guidelines. So more of these levels, you know, get this in your head, the one through five from driver assist, partial automation, conditional automation, high automation to full automation. So we discussed some of this now. You know that uh, you know so this is semi repetitive of going over get the stuff in our head what are these different technologies so you have global positioning systems lidar light detection and ranging cameras ultrasonic sensors central computer radar sensors dedicated short range communications based receiver all these different things working in tandem in order to produce a driverless vehicle. So cameras provide real-time obstacle detection to facilitate lane departure and track roadway information. Radar radio waves detect short and long range depth. LIDAR measures distance by illuminating target with pulse laser light and measuring reflected pulses with sensors to create 3D map of area. GPS triangulates position of car using satellites. Current GPS technology is limited to a certain distance. Advanced GPS is in development. Ultrasonic sensors uses high frequency sound waves and bounce back to calculate distance, uh, best in close range. Central computer brain of the vehicle receives information from various components and helps to direct vehicle overall. DRSC based receiver communication device permitting vehicle to communicate with other vehicles, V to V, vehicle to vehicle. Wireless communication standards that enable reliable data transmission and active safety applications. Different companies currently working on, currently have applications up to level three automation. You look at the, the different companies who they're partnering with. Some recent developments, January 2017, Carolus and Navion in partnership with the city of Las Vegas launched the first autonomous fully electric shuttle to be deployed in a public roadway in the United States. In January 2018, Toyota announces e-pallet concept vehicle, which is fully electric autonomous vehicle that can be customized by a partner for applications such as food deliveries, ride sharing, or storefronts. And Udev, a Bay Area tech company, completed the first delivery of goods by self-driving car when it delivered groceries in San Mateo. February 2018, Hyundai announced that a fleet of its fuel cell electric cars made a successful fully automated trip from Seoul Another place in Korea, this is the first time a level four car has been operated with fuel cell electric cars. So a lot of regulation, um, your government policy, your liability, personal industry, in injury, cybersecurity, data breaches, intellectually property ownership. So what type of uh, regulation? The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the NHTSA, which I showed earlier, the PowerPoint, within the Department of Transportation specifies minimum safety performance requirements for motor vehicles and equipment. Automakers must certify compliance before selling vehicles. Fully autonomous vehicles would not meet current federal motor vehicle safety standards. Uh, 
So DOT released new guidelines on autonomous vehicles in September 2017 titled Automated Driving Systems 2.0 Vision for Safety replaces guidance issued in 2016 by the Obama administration. 12 safety elements, safe, system safety, operational design domain, object and event detection and response, fallback validation methods, human machine interface, vehicle cybersecurity crash worthiness, post-crash ADS behavior, data recording, consumer education and training, federal, state, and local laws, recommends that entities involved in ADS testing and deployment demonstrate how they address the 12 safety elements by publishing a voluntary safety self-assessment. So the National Highway uh, Transportation Safety Administration requested comments on regulatory barriers to automated safety technology. The Federal Highway Administration, um, Federal Transit Administration. So basically the government is requesting to work together with the corporations uh, in, their, in the information gathering phases before you know, comprehensive legislation could be passed. In, um, so 23 states and the District of Columbia passed legislation governing autonomous vehicles. 10 additional states have executive orders in place issued by their governors related to autonomous vehicles. Arizona, California, Florida, and Michigan, and Nevada the most active. So you know, for those who know anything about law and liability, Will courts treat autonomous vehicles as drivers and apply a negligence standard or as a sophisticated technology and apply a product liability? So who's liable when something goes wrong? Is it the product or the driver? And how will liability be apportioned? So Michigan, one of the states, shield manufacturers from liability for damages resulting from third-party conversion of vehicle into autonomous vehicle, except where damages are caused by a defect present in vehicle as originally manufactured. So you have warranties and indemnifications. You were talking about cybersecurity, all the different points that, uh, you know, any any point where data is transferred is a potential point for data to be breached. Go over some of the vocabulary, some of these components, what they are. So the electronic control units, ECUs, are embedded systems that control one or more electric systems or subsystems within a vehicle and are connected via an internal network. They control systems like the engine and transmission, steering and brakes, infotainment, lighting, risk arise when access to ECUs are breached and malicious actors are able to assess certain ECUs or the whole network. Vehicles today have made up to 100 ECUs on board. The OBD2 diagnostic ports, every car manufactured after 1996 and sold in the U.S. must have this OBD2 diagnostic port installed. The port was originally mandated to permit monitoring of emissions it is increasingly used to facilitate non-diagnostic features like enabling Wi-Fi or enabling insurance company to track usage through attachment of a dongle to the port. These ports can provide a means of access for attackers and otherwise secure system. And the DSRC-based receivers we talked about before is uh, a means of encouraging vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication. Shortwave communications can be subject to spoofing and other attacks is pushed to move to more advanced 5G based communication, you know, software glitches. So, you know, save the time. I've, I've studied cybersecurity, and that's actually one of the fields where Israel is one of the greatest experts in, in the different kinds of attacks. And I'm just not going to have time to cover all this today. I'm going to put, uh, I'll put this PDF link in the chat if anyone wants to uh, read this on their own. The McKinsey survey, 2,000 buyers. Interesting. I don't have time to go over all this stuff, and I, I have a lot more information. So, uh, you know, I put I put it in the chat. And you know, cybersecurity, data privacy is very important. So, you have collecting collection of data. Um, who's collecting the data? The car? Where is it being sent to? Manufacturers? Um, this is very complicated. Um, I actually have studied this quite a bit. I'm not an expert in the field, but I'm knowledgeable in the field. And uh, But 
don't have time to cover all this stuff today about uh, cybersecurity and data transfer. You know, what data is available, who might want it, what they're going to do with it, you know, who's going to regulate it. You're know, saying this is why you get paid the big bucks for understanding these things. Uh, you know, Federal Trade Commission, the different things and legislation and lobbying. We talk about like APEC. Um, but in reality, this is why you get paid the big bucks for understanding this stuff. So the key privacy takeaways, privacy protection systems into system design, computer privacy protection should be considered at each stage of system development and implementation. You have to obtain consent collection of some forms of consumer information. Collection, you're collecting information. People are, know what information is being collected, uh, you know, different uh, protection laws that have to be uh, complied with. Intellectual property, all the different patents and uh, you know, very complication. You know, my, my father was actually a patent attorney before he went to medical school. The type of stuff you get paid the big bucks for. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but you know, just look at uh, 2010 to 17. You'll see Bosch, a major auto supplier. They could basically make cars, but they don't. But they make components for basically every aspect of the car. I. Um, you know, they, they're at almost every convention I go to. They have close to a thousand patents related to autonomous vehicles. Then Audi behind them, Continental, Ford. Toyota's the global leader with uh, over 1,400 patents related to autonomous vehicle. Google only is 26. They don't have that many patents. I mean, Google, I guess, just had a bunch of money to throw into it. You know, saying what are they actually innovating is not as much as the car companies themselves. So we say autonomous driving, driver systems, telematics is including telecommunications, vehicle technologies, road transportation, road safety, electrical engineering, sensors, transportation, wireless communications, computer science, GPS technology. Artificial intelligence in order for the AV to operate in full range of environments with millions of changing aspects that will need to be accounted for. It will require AI, which will allow the base level software to be developed and tested with self-learning capability. Um, some of these have discussed in other ones. Uh, you know, look at some of the patents. For example, U.S. patent number 9,475,491, lane changing for autonomous vehicle, directed to a method for changing travel lanes by identifying and accepting a target gap between a pair of vehicles in an adjacent travel lane, another pat, uh, patent vehicle trajectory planning for autonomous vehicles, another one autonomous vehicle emergency braking methods. So there's thousands of patents related to this that already exist. And, uh, you know, this is the type of stuff that is not applicable to the average consumer or the person who's be seeing these changes, but for engineers, uh, this is extremely important. So there was already a case, YMO versus Uber. YMO sued Uber for trade secret misappropriation, alleging that the former engineer took 14,000 uh, K of documents. Case was settled for $245 million, 0.34% equity in Uber. Insurance. Look at the amount of data. You know, the average autonomous car is going to process 4,000 gigabytes of data per day. The average internet user uses 1.5 gigabytes. So even just the huge amount of data that is going to be involved in an autonomous vehicle. And the change in the insurance model that we discussed uh, briefly in the McKinsey model, and I'm going to be you know, showing you more information about that. Case state, you know, public transportation, we talked about maybe fleets changing over and the importance of infrastructure maintenance and interactivity with the vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communication. So we have Colios, if anyone's heard of them, one of the major companies in it, in Las Vegas, in Nevada, leading the way in legislation and regulatory changes to facilitate the introduction of autonomous and connected vehicles. Colios operates 
Navia supplied Armina shuttle that seats up to eight passengers six day a week and operates eight hour eight hours a day in traffic in a pilot sponsored by AAA. Finalizing agreements highlighted range of issues, including roles and responsibilities of the party regulatory requirements, intellectual property, cybersecurity, vehicle maintenance, vehicle attendant roles, and responsibilities in risk management. Okay, that was a good one. That was, you know, leading experts of the field. This is what I do. Um, I'm an engineer. That's my field of expertise. Um, you know, say like Judaism is my passion. People I'm most you know, famous or known on internet for arguing about multiculturalism and immigration, uh, but by field, I'm an engineer. I'm a civil engineer, and uh, I'm not an automotive engineer, but civil engineer that's related, and I'm here in Detroit. My mother was an automotive uh, bankruptcy attorney, uh, but did a lot of work for automotive companies. So, you know, saying this is why this, you get paid the big bucks. This is uh, professionally, and, uh, you know, just interesting to, uh, you know, I thought it'd be interesting. So, Got some more. Let's keep it going. Just want to uh, put it out there for people, you know, develop a community of interest on these things, show people what I do for people who follow my YouTube. And I hope to be streaming more in real life live streaming from these technology conferences and maybe even having experts on the issue. Duvid is not an expert on this, although it is my field. You know, as a civil engineer, I just know the um, engineering basics related to infrastructure um, to this. I'm not an expert on this. So here's Barclays Bank that uh, he was looking at the economic transformation that will come from driverless cars. Obviously, automobiles are one of the biggest economic factors, like in terms of robotics and many manufacturing things, new technologies, kind of like automotive or bust. I believe that automobiles are over 50% of all of manufacturing worldwide because you know automobiles are kind of like a, a house. Everyone has one and maybe like a refrigerator or something. And, and uh, you know, automobiles are by far the biggest um, part of uh, global manufacture. So the Queen, in the UK, the Queen gave a speech in 2016 that Britain speaks to lead the world in autonomous vehicle testing. Initial plan was to introduce driverless testing in the UK roads in 2017 with a view to paving the way towards nationwide introduction as soon as 2020. This is already happening. So we're going to be, this uh, is more talking about the UK, but uh, you know, here their statistics say 94% of accidents are caused by human error. Trials of driverless cars. So we see, we've seen this in other things. You know, here we're more global. So Singapore 2016 self-driving taxi trial by Nutanomi, a U.S. startup founded by two MIT researchers. So we've seen some of these uh, hands-free parallel parking, lane control, adaptive cruise control, assisted braking. All these things are currently available on the open market for purchase. A lot of different companies involved. Uh, Mobileye produces the technology behind uh, uh, ADS, was that uh, assisted driver for manufacturing Honda, GM, and Ford partner with BMW and Intel to bring driverless cars to full production by 2021. BMW cars already use mobilized software and sensors to enable features like assisted braking. And the two have partnered with Intel because according to Intel CEO, highly autonomous cars and everything they connect to will require powerful and reliable electronic brains to make them smart enough to navigate traffic and avoid accidents. So part suppliers, will need to be aware that if driverless cars means less cars sold, then they will have to be agile and looking at their products portfolios, dropping products that have reached the end of their cycle faster and adapting them to seek out new areas of growth. So you see the type of change in economics to part suppliers. Devan demand for uh, vehicles holds up. Um, autonomous vehicles will unlikely curb the demand for vehicles. Barclays estimates the number of cars per household will fall from 2.1 currently to 1.2. There'll be less cars per household. 
and uh, possibly you know, predict they'll get down to less than one car per household because of car sharing and autonomous vehicles don't need to be sitting in your driveway. They could go out and do different things. And we talked about the ownership where you might not actually own the car. You'll pay per, per mile for the use of the car. Supply chain effect beyond vehicle manufacturers, a huge potential cost savings across the industry more broadly, particularly the cost of logistics trickling down through the supply chain. So at the very least, platooning is one area that has very keenly been looked at as a way to make significant cost savings on fuel. Cycling or motorsport fans may be familiar with the concept and the more common names of chain ganging or drafting. Truck platooning allows a line of lorries to travel much closer together than would normally be safe to do so with the following lorries passing control of the steering. I mentioned this in uh, one of the PowerPoints earlier that uh, you know tailgating is one of the safest things you could do to avoid accidents not following too closely behind. Uh, but by autonomous, uh, autonomizing the vehicles, um, cars will be able to follow much closer safely to each other. And that uh, you know braking and uh, speeding up is one of the biggest drags on fuel that uh, you know that if you're you get into higher gear in your revolutions per minute or whatever, that uh, the less braking and speeding up the less fuel. So just being able to travel closer together safely will reduce fuel, will reduce energy demand and save money. Competitive advantage for rental firms has said um, it may no longer be that we own cars, but that we pay per cars per mile. I encourage people to read through this. The insurance industry changeover, we've discussed that before. So the insurance company is active, involved in how these changes. So this is ABI, James Dalton. The developments we've seen towards increasing autonomous vehicles are already re reaping rewards with autonomous emergency braking, reducing collisions and injury, and helping to bring down insurance premiums. Truly driverless cars have the potential to dramatically reduce deaths and injuries on the roads and could revolutionize what we think of as public transport. The role of motor insurance is such and such a future will be very different to what is today, but insurance will be part of the picture. So we said, you know, most accidents are caused by human error. Healthcare and mobility, you know, things like ambulance and uh, all, all different type things. Every part of society could be changed by autonomous vehicles. And uh, now we're looking about uh, you know space, you know parking, these different issues that um, a lot of different things are going to change the economic picture of how we structure our life based on the new technology of autonomous vehicles. Suburban, urban areas, uh, how we develop our houses and how we live. You know, say that uh, when you build today, you don't just build for yourself in your house; you build for your car. And so, in the nature of how we transport is done that might change the way we live for example if you uh you know instead of uh if you you know type on your phone you want to go somewhere and the car could be parked at a lot and uh, you don't need a driveway or a, a garage if the car could come to you on demand and, and these are complicated things to think about and obviously there's going to be a lot of corresponding converging technologies okay so that's key takeaway Autonomous vehicles are soon to be a reality with a number of high-profile trials. Automotive industry, less cars could mean part suppliers could see a decrease in volume, but with the technology likely to be more expensive, uh, could limit the financial impact. Potential cost saving across manufacturing and cost of logistics, for example, through truck platooning. Technology investment opportunities lie in the infrastructure for autonomous vehicles, charging points, communication between vehicles, as well as features and entertainment that will come with your car. Ensuring driverless vehicles remains an open question. Who will be liable, the manufacturer, programmer, driver, or the maintenance company? Communications and public transport could see a significant change with driverless buses and ambulance and even shared ownership of all transforming suburbia. Okay, let me check the chat. Yeah, okay. Appreciate people participating, enjoying some of this. Um, Here's a few longer papers. This one is uh, in the last few weeks. So this is your most modern information. 
um, autonomous vehicle implementation, predictions, implications for transport planning. And as I said, this is from March 18, 2019. The Victoria um, Transport Policy Institute, I guess in Canada, uh, you know, Waymo, self-driving taxis. This report explores autonomous, also called self-driving uh, driverless or robotic vehicles, benefits and costs, and implications for various planning issues. It investigates how quickly self-driving vehicles are likely to be developed and deployed based on experience with previous vehicle technologies, their benefits and costs, and how they are likely to affect travel demands and planning decisions such as optimal road parking and transit, public transit supply. This analysis indicates that some benefits, such as more independent mobility for affluent non-drivers, may begin in 2020 and 2030, but most impacts, including reduced traffic and parking congestion, and therefore infra infrastructure savings, independent mobility for low-income people, and therefore reduced need for public transit, increased safety, energy conservation, and pollution reductions, will only be significant when autonomous vehicles become common and affordable probably in 2040 to 50. So I looked through this, I read through this twice, skimmed through it. There's some really good information in this. <coughs> if, uh, I'm losing my voice. Um, you know, hope if someone's watching, I encourage you to uh, look this open and there's some really good material in here, I think. I don't have the voice to read too much of that, but you know, look at uh, more of these levels. You know, Cost and benefits. The main benefit will come to uh, the time that we spend driving, that we'll be able to do something else with the time. Change the travel experience, you know, technology, entertainment, or what we see in cars, computers, and different things when the, the driving becomes less important. So let's look at some of the cost. Autonomous vehicles require various equipment and service summarized in the box below. Such technologies can add thousands of dollars to vehicle purchase prices and hundreds of, of dollars to annual fees. For example, a package of optional electronic features such as remote starting, high beam assist, active lane assist, adaptive cruise control, and top, cam top view camera typically increases the new vehicle prices by more than $5,000. And navigation and security services such as OnStar and TomTom cost two to $600 uh, per year. Since failures could be deadly, autonomous driving systems will need robust, redundant, and abuse-resistant components maintained by specialists similar to aviation service standards. Further increasing cost to monitor passenger behavior, autonomous vehicles will also require in-vehicle security cameras and enforceable behavior rules, plus frequent interior cleaning and repairs. We went over a lot of this equipment. So here it's saying level four and five autonomous driving capabilities will increase vehicle purchase price by several thousands of dollars. And it's only likely that you know, expensive cars will be able to be autonomous. Cleaning could be another expense. So let me blow this up as big as I can this night. Automotive versus personal costs. So right now we're looking at uh, the different factors, um, automated versus personal car costs. You have these like fleet management costs, autonomous hardware, mobility provider, revenue, revenue license registration, insurance, financing. And, and so right now you're looking at about 90 cents per mile and that's predicted to fall in half or more. So Johnson Walker predicted automated mobility service using electric sedan will decline from 85 cents per mile currently to about 35 cents per mile in 2035, less than half of a typical personal sedan's total cost of ownership. So currently automated vehicles are only slightly more expensive than conventional vehicles, and that is predicted to fall um, more in half. So you're looking at like the Tesla model now, about eighty thousand dollars. That uh, by two thousand thirty-five might be forty thousand dollars. So here you put it in dollars per mile. We're looking at autonomous vehicles versus human-driven. And look at like taxis. A human-driven cab costs 
close to two and a half dollars per mile as where an AV cab could cost less than a dollar. So, I mean, it's going to just be more cost efficient to have driverless cars. This has been well studied in saying driverless cars are the future. It's very unlikely unless uh, the, our inability to come together as a society, but that's the direction of technology. Obviously, we've talked a lot about traffic safety and security. Losing my voice cost to read through this. So the external cost. Advocates claim that autonomous driving will reduce external costs by including traffic congestion, energy consumption, pollution emissions, roadway and parking facility costs. All those benefits are uncertain. To be more space and energy efficient, autonomous vehicles require dedicated lanes for the tuning. This is only feasible on grade separated highways. The infrastructure is going to have to change in order for you know, autonomous vehicles to uh, take over the roads. Be uh, you know, possibly require better maintained highways. You know, here in Michigan, that's a huge issue. The governor's race, uh, Democrat uh, Governor Whitmore got into office largely saying she's going to tax us to fix the roads. They didn't believe the Republican would be able to fix the roads without taxing us. So you got a like a SWAT analysis or, or a benefits and cost internal and external encourage people to read through this i'm losing my voice so i'm not going to be able to read that much of it interesting uh cars require much more complex computer systems than aircrafts because of you know i guess in the air um there's less uh things to process so the automobiles might uh, you might have uh, auto airplanes uh, you know, more and even currently, you know, airplanes do have autopilot that actually auto vehicles are more difficult technology wise. So I said, this is the most recent report. I thought there was some good visuals through here. So here we're the automatic transmission took 50 years to adapt airbags 25 um, the you know the long uh, the cost premium automatic transmission costs fifty fifteen hundred dollars more. Airbags only a few hundred miles. Hybrid view vehicles now cost five thousand dollars more. So the adaption rate uh, for these different technologies. If anyone knows your innovation S curve, you know, apply that to a car. So you got exact data for more financial people. I'm losing my voice and I want to get through more stuff. So people encourage them to read through it on their own. Well, I'll check the chat in a minute if people want to discuss this. I thought there were some nice graphics. So, you know, affecting, you have demographic trends, the aging population, working at home, um, price changes, fuel costs, uh, traveling options, uh, you know, walkability, user preference, intelligence, uh, transport systems, difference in planning. There's a lot of good information. I'm just losing my, my voice. So let's, here's what I wanted to show. Check the chat. Yeah, so this one had some really good uh, um, timeline. So as I said, this was written uh, just a few weeks ago. So t by 2020, you're going to have large-scale autonomous vehicle testing and evaluate cost-benefit. 2030, um, you're likely to have switchovers for whole surf fleets and taxis, you know, some more. Um, by 2040, if they prove to be effective, they'll consider changing over major highways and roads in America. 2050, um, once those changes are made, um, your know, future design of all roads will be different from just, you know, lane changes. And, uh, you know, by 2060, you might see the restriction of human driving. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. And, you know, these are long things, but uh, 
I got three more things to show and go over. If anyone's watching, I hope uh, they're enjoying it. So, yeah, the unemployment or leisure, what's going to happen in the change of economics and employment from people losing their job is, is something beyond uh, the scope of this uh, public study session. So, this is from Stanford University. And we're looking at regulation. So, technology and infrastructure, products and service. So we're saying here, many cars sold today are already capable of some level of automated operation and prototype cars capable of driving autonomously have been and continue to be tested on public roads in Europe, Japan, and the United States. These technologies have arrived rapidly on the market and their future deployment is expected to accelerate. Automate, uh, so what they found, autonomous driving technologies are mostly mature and some autonomous driving is already here. Self-driving cars seem a near-term possibility but their range of capabilities is unclear. Road safety is expected to improve with vehicle automation, but this effects remains untested at a large scale. There are many possible technological configurations for autonomous driving. We don't know which direction we're gonna go. There are two incremental paths towards full automation. That's what we're gonna discuss here. The first path involves gradually improving the automation in conventional vehicles so that human drivers can shift more of the dynamic driving tasks of these systems. The second path involves deploying vehicles without a human driver in limited context, and then gradually expanding the range and conditions of their use. The first path is generally embraced by traditional car manufacturers, and the second by new entrants. And you know, both are happening simultaneously. So there's a lot of stuff about policy here that yeah, I just don't have the voice, and I hope I encourage people to read. We look at the the technology, so we've seen the different sensors and uh, what's going to be detected. You know, the long range radar, lidar, camera, short range meteor, uh, medium radar, ultrasound, all acting simultaneously on the same car. Okay, we've discussed you know what's currently here: systems, um, lane change assist, park distance control, lane departure warning, front collision warning. Um, these things are already here, uh, where where these are just warnings to the driver, where the driver could be warned uh, that uh, something you know requires their attention. To uh, level one, where the car could actually automatically act on it, adaptive cruise control, for example lane keeping assist, park assist. Here's another pathway looking at the different levels and type uh, year expected, you know, again, 2030, expect to see taxis in delivery vehicles on the road basically taken over, um, you know, cars going to level two and three, and currently level two and three will, over the next 10 years, will become very common, and you'll, you know, you might even own yourself one of these, um, you know, traffic jam chauffeur, conditional automated driving congested conditions up to 60 kilometers an hour on motorways and motor-like roads. System controls the forward, backwards, and lateral movements of the vehicle to the threshold speed. The driver must deliver activate the system. Highway chauffeur, conditional automated driving up to 130 kilometers per hour on motorways or motorway-like roads. Operates from entrance to exit on all lanes. Highway pilot. So, you know, further, you know, when are we gonna see these? What years are we gonna see them? Um, you know, so these are nice graphics. I wanted to make sure to get them get them there. You know, established technology already existed. You can see a lot of this stuff already exists.
So, you know, people are curious about, uh, and then we have more about regulation here. So people are curious about when you're going to see this on the road. Um, you know, th this is some nice graphics and it's got some worldwide, uh, you know, different things that are happening around the world. Okay. One last, one last, uh, paper. And then, uh, I did building permits. I used to do DOT permits and, uh, you know, I knew the Williamsburg, the bike wars, I'll be done in probably like 15 minutes. I got one last thing from Cognizant and IT company, some good, more good stuff. And then the Society of Automotive Engineering, which will have uh, some of the most up-to-date um, what's, ha what's happening that I'm going to close with. Automobile and Cognizant, one of the big IT companies in the world. Automobile industry has continuously evolved over the decades, but not as dramatically as the emergence of the driverless car. What still seemed like science fiction a few years back is now a reality. Along with the excitement and interest, the rollout of these driverless cars is also having ripple effects across related industries. For example, insurance carriers are wondering how this innovation will impact the auto insurance space. So I look forward to a few different things. This might be more related to uh, insurance, but it had nice uh, time outlays from Cognizant, obviously a major company looking, you know, as we, we looked at the, so this is on the NHTSA levels, which only had level one through four as opposed to the SA levels through five insane levels. One and two were driver assist. Uh, Semi-autonomous are already available, like we showed Tesla um, level three. That's just coming out right now through 2030. Uh, by 2022, you could expect there to be working self-driving vehicles, whether um, you know, the regulation, how that's going to work, how much they're going to cost, who they're going to be available to. Um, but it's expected by 2022 that full self-driving automation cars will be available for purchase. Cost. Automotive predicts that the price level of three, four driverless cars will be seven to $10,000 more than manually driven cars in 2025. Additional cost will only be 5,000 by year 2030, 3,000 by year 2035. Although initial models of driverless cars might be cost prohibitive for many people, prices are expected to decline with the increase. Let me just make sure I put this in the link. They're, they're going to have nice graphics on this too, I'm pretty, I think. Uh, So this here we're looking at the current right now 2018 what's available you know what's coming and so I encourage people to download the link I put in and, and read it but the, this got some nice graphics and uh, you're looking at the the time frame for when this is going to be phased in and uh, how much it's going to cost. We're talking about underwriting, purchase price, insurance, claims management. So there's a lot of uh, you know, different factors here. Look at the partner ecosystem. You know, I, uh, Cognizance, an IT company. So you're talking about the vehicle to infrastructure, all the different data, who it's going to. You know, pretty complicated. So, you know, cognizant mostly in India. Okay, I got one last slideshow. This one's got 130 slides. And uh, yeah, I just mentioned the Tesla because that's what's currently on the market available. But as I said, uh, you know, that uh, it's predicted that price is going to come down significantly, uh, relatively um, quickly. And uh, although it's going to be expensive cars that are capable of bearing this equipment. So you might be, you know, the Tesla is like $80,000 now. So I'll, this one I'm going to put 
and if people want to look in more detail, I'm going to have to do full screen on, on this one. And, you know, this is uh, relatively recent, a few months ago, um, Society of Automotive Engineers. This is in Arizona, but SA is actually headquartered here in Detroit. I go to their events all the time. See the agenda. Arizona is one of the places where they have a lot of this uh, modern stuff being tested, like with the taxis. So I just wanted to show this to end up with to show, um, you know, the most recent. This has stuff about the drones to the, you know, so here you'll see the most current, what's currently available. So technology, social, regulatory, maybe economic, all these different uh, converging things coming at the same time. Looking at uh, Intel's road, you know, processing speed, the amount of processing power needed for driverless vehicles to be possible. All these we covered already before. So here we see the benefits, road safety, traffic efficiency, freed up space, pollution decrease, lower transportation costs, better service, equitable access to mobility. It's a bunch of these. I'm not going to have time to read through all of them. I put the link in the chat. How soon do you think? 20% of people think that you're going to see this on the road in five years. People about how they feel safe. Half of people don't think they'd feel safe in an autonomous vehicle. So a lot of survey questions. Um, we've looked at these before, you know, the different components that go into it, the visible camera, 3D cameras, night vision, LIDAR, ultrasound, a dead reckoning sensor, short range, long range. So, you know, some of this is more, this is a society of automotive engineers. So some of this is more technical, complicated. Look at some dollar amounts. LIDAR market currently makes up a $300 million market size. They predict that to grow to billions of dollars related to the need for um, you know, said LIDAR has been around since the 70s. It was used for the, you know, the, by NASA and the military, different things. As that comes into more common use in vehicles, the LIDAR is expected to be, and, and I've, LIDAR for construction and different, it has other uses I'm familiar with, and maybe we'll talk about it a different time for like uh, um, 3D scanning, which is a different field that's uh, very related to engineering. You got redundant systems, different monitoring, different things. You know, you got you got a you know multiple mounting of the radars. We saw this patent earlier on a different thing. You know, say like Bosch. Actually, Toyota had more patents, but maybe they're not a member. So you got forecast of mar market size for sensors that currently um, you know, radar ultrasonics already a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, these are predicted to go from 10 billion to uh, 20 billion to go over 20%. If anyone's investing in the stock market, um, you can consider these companies that are making these uh, you know, things that are gonna be in more demand. Your suppliers, not necessarily the car companies themselves, but the smaller companies, a lot of Israeli companies that have uh, um, been sold to larger companies for developing these technologies. See the leading companies. Just the different ways of understanding the market. There's a lot of good slides in here. I look through these a few times, but uh, you know, hopefully people are watching. And I'm not going to talk through all of them. 
and a lot of these I don't even understand myself. I'm not an expert in this. I'm not an automotive engineer. Uh, but coming up, there's going to be a lot of uh, um, articles on the most recent uh, developments. You know, there's 130 slides here. I'm on 34 only. Internet of Things, topic for another day, something else I've studied immensely. I showed the Siemens conference and uh, all the different consumer companies involved in um, the connected car landscape. See grids, 5G, the relevance of uh, data transfer technology to driverless cars. There's multiple technologies that are converging at the same time, 5G, 5G connectivity. And we talk about vehicle to uh, infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to network, and all these different things of the transferring of data, like internet of things and uh, sensors all over the place, transferring data back and forth to uh, make autonomous vehicle possible. And uh, I'm not an expert on this, the different types of data transfer technology of, uh, you know, people like computer, internet technology, internet speed, that's relevant, um, extremely relevant, because as I said, the amount of data necessary for autonomous vehicles is much greater than the amount of data that we use for regular internet usage. So communication between vehicles, vehicle to vehicle. You know, example here, you know, do not pass because the other vehicles making turns, information, and even people where you know people now have watches or cell phones that would be transferring this data to help warn the cars. So there'd be sensors, but at the same time, uh, there would be data points on uh, you know bicycles and cell phones on kids that would directly transmit information to the vehicles and you know, list of all the different companies. Here's a, you know, 5G predicted by 2020 massive broadband. If people are familiar with this technology and uh, you know, so the unveiling of 5G is a, uh, will go uh, simultaneously with autonomous vehicles. You know, vehicle to vehicle, it could tap right into the car, control the car. We went over this. I put the link in the chat. People want to know more about it. Um, you'll see a lot of articles in the most recent development of what's going on. I'm not going to be able to talk through a lot of these. So let me just uh, get through these. So the Saudis investing a lot of money. So interesting, obviously, the Saudi Arabia, the Middle Eastern countries, making a bunch of money off of oil. However, um, of alternative energy, autonomous vehicles, non-oil so sources, the Saudis and uh, other Middle East oil countries are actually some of the bigger investors and owners of this future technology. And maybe that they felt that that strategically was a good way to go because they've made money off the car and oil, and they figure that they'll control the direction of the automobile by investing in the replacement for the oil. So you got different technology here. We talked about Amazon Robotics for, you're saying automation um, is uh, autonomous cars, but uh, you know Amazon's got patents for uh, their uh, warehouses. Hoverboard, it's real, it exists. At company timelines here, predictions from the companies. See the fallen cost point, mobility per mile. Actually, the horse relatively was more expensive than the car, and the autonomous vehicle will be less expensive than the car. Obviously, most people couldn't afford horses. So 
So you got two different uh, scenarios, the evolution versus revolution, the gradual shift versus the disruptive shift. In terms of urban planning, another area of expertise. Uh, I mean, that, I don't know, expertise, but I'm closer to expert in urban planning, you know, civil engineering, and hopefully I'll be doing more streaming on these type of issues. So I, I put this in the link, but this, you know, this has collected uh, the most recent developments and articles about what's happening in the driverless cars. So I don't have the energy to talk through these. And I've looked through these before. If you read the newspapers, maybe you've uh, seen some of this stuff in the papers. Your driverless car is delivering groceries in Arizona. It's already happening. Kroger. Changing the fleets of trucks, it's already happening. Tesla working on the big rig truck, 500 mile range. Internet of Things, important issue. Maybe I'll do a study session on that sometime. You know, there we got boring companies, um, you know, autonomous, you know, uh, autonomous uh, is going to manufacture across industrial operations of everything. People have been following Elon Musk's like boring the holes and uh, making uh, tunnels and in uh, interesting things. People have been following that. It's related. Vehicle transport company tunnels. Tesla, a lot of Elon Musk, if people follow him, there's a lot of a lot of interesting things that I don't have time or the voice to talk about. Future of drones, possibly like uh, cars that also fly. These things have been tested. Some models have been built. You got a city Airbus feasibility study. Um, prediction is the feasib the city Airbus takes to the sky in 2023. Multi-passenger, self-piloted electric vehicle, vertical takeoff and landing, demonstrator design for urban air mobility with cost efficiency, high volume production, and low environmental footprint in mind. So expect to see these by in the next five years. They already exist, you know, really, they've already, but uh, to see them on the open market, that you might see these things flying around in your cities in the next few years. So electric aviation, possibly that uh, airplanes are going to be able to go to electric. Deliveries, drones making deliveries already exists. Um, look to see more regulation. A lot of the stuff I cover for autonomous vehicles will be applicable for these drones. Changing a low flying vehicles that uh, you, instead of the you know typically high flying vehicles that there's going to be more of ability for low flying vehicles. And you say this is not science fiction. Stuff exists. Robotics, the increase of the use of robotics. I might do another public study session on that, uh, you know, automation and robotics in general connected. A lot of people, you know, talking about that related to Yang Gang and different things. What's really going on, you know, saying at the end of the day, this is why you make the big bucks for understanding, learn to code, learn science and technology. Um, a lot of good information here. You know, saying this is for engineers, Society of Automotive Engineering. It's more complicated. It's like an adaption curve. SpaceX, possibly expansion to the sky. Okay, that's it for my presentation. Hope people enjoy. You get five people watching. Um, so Lucid, put a link in the chat. Yeah, okay. So uh, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you watching. My voice is kind of losing. Um, yeah, I'm vegetarian. I've done streams on vegetarianism. 
a lot of different topics. Um, you know, I, I like to keep it topical. I like to do more research. Maybe you'll have discussions. Obviously, I'm not sure if I'm going to be streaming with Brundle later this week or what's up with any of that. Um, hopefully, I'll stream the third part this uh, later this week of the immigration, the Islamic and Jewish immigration series. There'll be an in real life streaming the third part in the series. And uh, they have the foam convention here in Michigan. And so maybe I'll do a stream from the foam convention. You'll see the companies that are involved in uh, foam products from all over the world. And it's actually related. Foam is lightweight. And uh, there's been a lot of foam, you know, the, the foam conventions here in Detroit largely related to the automobile industry in that uh, you'll see if I live stream from there, all the different foam components in construction. And, and so it's interesting. I've been going to the foam convention now for two years. You got to really love science and uh, infrastructure and you know, make America great again. Um, you know, like I, I streamed the chess from uh, the DIA and I mentioned all the names on the wall and the people who made their money and are making donations and like all the different companies and, you know, saying like, okay, like just the man and his machine trying to sell his product. And uh, there's hundreds of companies that make, you know, millions of companies really that make tiny components and different things. And any of these factory owners are selling something to be millionaires and salesmen and how they make their money. And so there's thousands of companies making foam products. I don't know, thousands, but there'll be hundreds of engineers, probably, th I mean, thousands of engineers, hundreds of companies from all over the world demonstrating their foam technology here in Metro Detroit largely looking to sell to the automotive industry because in uh, manufacture, a lot of times it's uh, automotive or bust because the biggest customer for products is auto the automotive industry. So if you have a product that you're making and, and you want to uh, make maximize your profit off of it, you want it to be applicable to the automotive industry because within manufacturer, automotive is the single biggest buyer. Okay, so I think I'm gonna sign sign off here, and uh, I'm glad you tuned in. Hope you enjoyed it. I did this largely for my own study. You know, it's a public study session, and uh, I'll rewatch this for myself. And I think I'm actually getting a tour. I showed you the testing facility for autonomous vehicles in Metro Detroit. I'm not sure if they'll let me take pictures or live stream. If they do, hopefully I'll live stream that, and we'll show you. Detroit's groundbreaking facility that we're te where we're testing these autonomous vehicles. And, uh, you know, so largely this was a public study session for my own personal business and what I'm involved in here in Detroit. So if I could in real life do the Willow Run live stream and there there'll be experts, you know, the industry leaders that will be explaining this most recent technology. And uh, so take care, everyone. Have a good night. Shabbat Blessings, everyone.